مرحبا أنا الدكتور مصطفى قباني بتمنى الجميع يكون بخير عم سجل محاضرة اليوم من الشارقة بالإمارات العربية المتحدة بالبداية بحب أتوجه بالشكر للدكتور مازن دوماني لأعطائي هي الفرصة الرائعة حتى شارك بهذا المؤتمر الأكثر من رائع اللي عم بيعالج وبيتناول مواضيع مختلفة بالاختصاصات المختلفة لطب الأسنان موضوع اليوم عن الـ Mist Anatomy Frequency and Clinical Impact Alright, it's generally accepted that a major cause of the failure of root canal therapy is the inability to localize and treat all of the canals of the root canal system. The risk of missing anatomy during root canal treatment is high because of the complexity of the root canal system. All teeth may have extra root or canals, but the likelihood of finding an extra canal configuration or a complex canal configuration is higher in premolars or molars, for example, when we compare them to maxillary centrals or lateral incisors. In addition, lateral ramifications of the root canal system may be present in all teeth with a significant frequency, increasing the probability of leaving untreated spaces after root canal therapy. So in the beginning, let me list the contents of this lecture. First of all, I will start with the introduction, then the objectives of root canal treatment. I will talk about the root canal system, the classifications of the canals, Vertucci's classification, and then I will mention the impact of untreating all the root canals in a tooth, then I will show you some cases before I end with a conclusion and references. All right, the reason why I put this x-ray on the right side is to show you that we are always treating a root canal complex rather than canals only. We should expect having lateral canals or accessory canals. It's impossible sometimes to physically clean the root canal system with endodontic files only. This is why we should always depend on the chemical irrigation, ultrasonic cleaning, and we should end the job with a firm root canal filling or obturation. And only with the following of the mentioned points, we should expect a complete healing or um, a successful root canal treatment. So, in the beginning, let me ask you, what are the major factors for development of pulp and periradicular diseases? First of all, caries or loss of coronal tooth substance integrity. Number two, leakage of bacteria uh, or entry of microorganisms into the dentin and pulpal spaces. We can see the gross caries in the clinical photo of the first molar, and we can see the huge apical or periradicular lesion around the root of the lower seven, which is huge, and it was a little bit dangerous as the patient was already having numbness due to the proximity of the lesion to the ion nerve. When taking the history of the lower second molar, I knew from the patient that in the beginning she had a curious lesion. She went to her dentist and he filled the tooth but after that, she developed some signs of irreversible pulpitis. So she went back to the dentist who did the root canal treatment, which is kind of fair. We can see from the x-ray number one that he filled uh, with gutta percha almost the entire length of the tooth. But he had one missing canal in the distal. And maybe there was a problem with the disinfection, which allowed the microorganisms or the bacteria to develop um, 
apical lesion and uh, periradicular disease. The tooth was very tender on percussion and the patient couldn't even touch the tooth with her finger. Beside what I mentioned earlier, she had numbness due to the huge uh, size of the lesion and the proximity of the lesion to the IA nerve. The objective or the aim of the root canal treatment is to clean the uh, pulp space complex chemomechanically from any bacteria or microorganism and to fill that space in a 3D filling or obturation. On the x-ray on the right side, we can see how the root canal system can be very complex. In this case, it's a retreatment case. We can see how the two canals join at the middle third to form a single canal, and then they divide again to exit the root canal system into two different portal of exits. Here we have a table that shows the objective of root canal treatment. We have uh, two main groups of objectives. We have mechanical objectives and biological objectives. First, let me start with the mechanical objectives. First of all, we have to prepare a sound anatomical matrix. We have to create a continuous taper funnel shaped canals. We should avoid aggressive instrumentation we should pre-curve the files when we have to and we have to remove all the bacteria and debris from the inside canal and finally we have to maintain the patency through the apical foramen so the canal has to be patent all the time why the biological objectives are to first of all to uh, establish a correct working length to keep the instrumentation within the canal, so your file should never prepare outside the canal. This is why it's very important to have a correct working length. And we have to remove all the irritants from the inside canal, and we should avoid pushing the uh, necrotic uh, tissues, for example, or bacteria beyond the apical constriction. And finally, we have to uh, prepare um, uh, the coronal and middle halves of the canal uh, well in a way that we can ensure that our copious irrigation is reaching the apical part to work effectively on the bacteria and the other debris. All right, now the root canal system is defined by Cohen as the entire space in the dentin where the pulp is housed. Okay, we can see from this figure that the root canal system can be very complex. So we can see here how the root canal system can be divided into pulp chamber and root canal. We can see how we have lateral canals or forcation canals. And also we may have accessory formina, apical formina and apical delta. So when we do a root canal treatment, we are not treating the canal itself. We are treating the entire complex. All right, now let me start talking about the first part, which is the pulp chamber. Pulp chamber is made of roof of pulp chamber, which is the dentin uh, covering the uh, pulp chamber occlusally or incisally here is the dentin covering the pulp chamber occlusally or incisally in case of an anterior tooth we have also pulp horns which are an accentuation of the roof of the pulp chamber directly under cusp this one we also have the floor of pulp chamber this one in the clinical photo or here in the diagram, which usually run in parallel way to the roof and consist of dentin bounding the pulp chamber near the cervical area of the tooth. Here we can see the floor of the pulp chamber and these dark lines 
are very important in locating canals and we call them developmental grooves. Finally, we have canal orifices, these two holes here in the clinical photo, which are an openings in the floor of the pulp chamber that lead to the root canal. All right, so now let's move on to the um, apical uh, anatomy of a tooth. The terminal part of a tooth root exhibits usually four distinct landmarks. Here we can see three of them, which are the apical construction, the apical foramen, and the cemento-dentin junction, CDJ. And also, I should mention that we have here the... Uh, anatomic uh, apex or radiographic apex. So here we have to add the anatomical apex or the radiographic apex beside the apical construction, the cemento-dentin junction, and the apical foramen. The apical construction is called also minor apical diameter, and the apical foramen is called major apical diameter. So let me start with the first part which is the apical construction or the minor apical diameter. The apical construction is the part of root canal with the smallest diameter here. We should always try to conserve this part of the root canal. It is a reference point for apical termination and usually the distance between the apical foramen to the apical construction is about 0.5 millimeter to 1.5 millimeter. Now the second part which is a cemento dentin junction cdj is a line of union between dentin and cementum at which pulpal tissue ends and periodontal tissue starts it's the point at which cementum and dentin meets it's about one millimeter from the apical foramen All right, now the third apical landmark, the apical foramen or the major apical diameter is, uh, is the part of the tooth that differentiate the terminal of cemental canal from the exterior surface of the tooth. It has a funnel shape and it's not necessarily to be at the center of the root apex. Usually, the average distance between the anatomical or radiographic apex and the uh, apical foramen is about 0.4 to 0.7 millimeter. So here we can see the radiographic apex or the anatomical apex. Here we can see the apical foramen. We can see that it's not exactly at the center of the root apex and uh, it's the part that differentiate the terminal of cemental canal from the exterior surface of the tooth. Now, the space between the major and minor apical diameter has a funnel shape or the shape of morning glory uh, flower. This is it. All right, and the mean distance between the major and minor apical diameter is about 0.5 millimeter in younger patient and about 0 0.7, uh, 0 0.67 millimeter in older patients. Well, the apical third is very significant part of the root canal treatment. It has the highest percentage of ramifications and accessory canal. This is why when we do uh, an apicectomy, we have to remove 
the apical three millimeter because in that part of the tooth we have a lot of accessory canals and ramifications all right now another um, anatomical complex anatomy that is very common in molars uh, which is uh, apical delta the apical delta can be defined as when the primary or secondary canal ends short of the apex with many many lateral canals as here this is a very complex anatomy and it's kind of hard to clean this type of anatomy with our hand files or rotary files and we usually depend on our irrigation and the activation of our irrigation to clean this part this part might be filled with a lot of bacteria or necrotic tissue this is why we have to clean this part very well to um, enhance the outcome of our root canal treatment and to have more predictable outcomes all right here let me ask you what are the reasons of the complexity of the apical third of the root canal all right here many believe that the occlusal loading may lead to the apical complexity as well as mesial migration of the teeth may lead to delaceration of the roots and we also have to know that the location of the apical, uh, the apical foramen and the apical anatomy keeps changing constantly. So what we have to know here that after the eruption of the tooth, most of the time the Hertwig epithelial root sheet is active and that means it keeps forming the root. The occlusal loading at this stage can cause discontinuity of this sheath which results in the formation of accessory foramen and lateral canals. Also, we have to know that the mesial migration of the tooth due to loading or due to the occlusal loading is another reason for the curvature at the apex and having delacerations of the roots. All right, now let's move to a more practical uh, side of this lecture, which is the Vertucci's classification of the root canal treatment. All right, what we have to know that Vertucci divided root canal morphology into eight types, which is more practical compared to the four types we generally follow by Winnie's classification. The one difference and problem with Vertucci classification that uh, they don't consider where the position and the exit position of the apical foramen, which is considered in Winnie's classification. All right, so here let me start with the type one. As we can see that the type one is a single canal that is present in the pulp chamber from the crown to the apex. Now we have type two which the pulp separates into two near the crown and joins at the apex to form one root canal. Here we have two and here we have one. They join here. All right, type three. The type three canal start as one canal in the pulpal chamber and divided into two as it's near the apical foramen and then fuses again to form a single root near the apical foramen. Type 4, the root separates into two distinct canals and extend till the root apex separately. Now, in type 5, the root canal is single till the apex of the root but dividing into two separate canals right before the apical foramen. In type 6, the root canal starts as two canals from the pulp chamber and a join at the middle of the root to form one canal and then extend till the apex and again divided into two canals just short of the apical foramen. Now, in type 7, 
the root canal start as a single pulp canal till the middle third and then divide into two separate canal and then they rejoin after some distance and then near the apex divide into two canals so here we have this configuration one canal then two canal then one canal again and finally again two canal the type 8 canal is a pulp chamber near the coronal portion divided into three separate root canals extending till the apex of the root All right, now, in the beginning in this slide, I want you to see the X-ray of the obturation of this premolar. We can see how the apical third ends. See how complex it is. This is a single canal that is separated at the apical third into two main canals and see all this ramifications and lateral canals also we can see how they are connected here to each other so due to the complexity of the root canal space it's not an uncommon practice to miss a canal while carrying out endodontic treatment especially for a tooth like a molar where one root one canal formula is frequently overruled by the fact that the number of canals are more than the number of roots moreover a less than adequate access opening make it difficult for the primary dentist to locate all the supplemental canals. So it's very important to have the knowledge about teeth anatomy, root canal configuration, and possible variation before starting the root canal treatment. So, through knowledge of dental anatomy, of how many canals to expect, their location, length, and relationships to each other, and its possible complexities variation, is very important to have a successful root canal treatment. The clinician should be ready enough to identify the presence of unusual number of root canals or root by carefully examining the radiograph and by close clinical inspection of the floor of the pulp chamber assisted with the use of loops or the operating microscope because the proper and ideal access to the root canal is very essential for a successful root canal treatment outcome. So here we can see in this case, this is a retreatment case. The patient came with a lot of pain. Uh, the treatment was done three years ago and she took medication because of the swelling and pain for a very long time. We can see here how the primary dentist missed the MB2. Here I located the MB2 in the third number three x-ray and the amazing thing to me is to see this very complex anatomy after the obturation see how the mb1 and mb2 connected to each other at many points all right now the question is is the inability to treat all the canals means failure for sure? Well, most of the time, yes, because the bacteria residing in these canals lead most of the time to the persistence of the symptoms. So, symptoms like apical periodontitis may still persist as asymptomatic radiolucencies because of the complexity of the root canal system. This is due to the presence of accessory canals, ramification, and osmosis where residual infection can persist. 
All right, so this is a retreatment case that was referred to me. The patient already knew that she has a lesion. Uh, she had asymptomatic apical periodontitis. She knew that she has a lesion and she was worried to have a big problem in the future. So she decided to retreat the tooth and save it. So when I saw the first x-ray, the preoperative x-ray, I was able to expect a second canal in the distal root. And when I saw the mesial canals, I knew that there is a problem here as the dentist, the primary dentist, was not able to reach the uh, full working length. And yes, it was a very difficult case as I faced ledges in both roots, mesial and distal, and in the bo in both uh, canals uh, of the mesial root, mesial buccal, and mesolingual. And after two visits, I was able to bypass the these ledges to reach the full working length. And then I was able to locate the second distal canal, as we can see here. And finally, this is the X-ray of obturation. We can see how we have a complex anatomy. We can see how the two mesial canals are two separate distinct canals coronally. And then at the middle third, they join each other and then they separate again apically and exit in two different uh, portal of exit. Also, we can see that the two distal canals join each other at the apical third and they exit from the same portal of exit. The inability of the primary dentist here to reach the full working length left the, these spaces untreated, full of bacteria and necrotic tissue, which led to these apical lesions. All right, so we have to know that the pulp space is always complex. Root canals may divide and rejoin. We also have to always expect an additional or extra root in a tooth, like radix in lower molars, for example. And we also have to expect having additional canals, and we should be always familiar with the different canals configuration. Here in this x-ray, we can see this premolar with two canals that join at the apical third to leave the root canal system from a single portal of exit. Also, we can see that we have here many lateral canals. The presence of these lateral canals in the apical third shows us the importance of having a good uh, irrigation protocol and good activation as we can't prepare these very tiny uh, structures with our uh, rotary files or hand files. All right, now this is another case of a maxillary premolar with two distinct separate roots. Each one of them has a main canal, but this canal splits uh, here at the apical area to give another lateral branch. So this canal exits from two different portal of exits. Here another maxillary premolar. This was a necrotic case for a pregnant lady who came to me when she was pregnant. So here I did a pulp extirpation and then uh, I put, uh, uh, I, I finished the initial preparation of the canals with size 10, 15 using Apex locator. Then I put a cotton NTF, uh, the tooth was necrotic here in this case. After delivery, she came back and I completed the case and you can see how the two canals are connected to each other at different sites.
All right, here another X-ray that shows the uh, complexity of the root canal space. This time, this is a maxillary molar. And uh, I was able to locate another portal of exit of this palatal canal. These are my size 10 files. I believe one of them is 10, the other one was 15. And you can see how I was able to scout the space of the palatal canal and have my files at different portal of exits. All right, now the roles of genetic and gender should also not be underestimated in determining anatomic variation of a human teeth. As uh, Scott and Turner in their anthropological review showed that the possibility of having an accessory root of a uh, first mandibular premolar showed a high incidence of a greater than 25% in ethnic Australians and sub-Sahara African populations. In contrast, American Arctic and Western Euro-Asian populations had a lower incidence of the accessory root. So, such anthropological data could provide valuable information regarding the likelihood of having an additional root in a specific tooth of a specific ethnic population. All right, now we have different methods that can be used to study the root canal anatomy, replication techniques, ground sections, clearing techniques, and radiography. The advanced modes of radiographic uh, imaging and analysis have allowed for in-depth knowledge of palpable space anatomy in three dimensions and allowed for identification of rare anatomies. These methods include the spiral computed tomography, SCT, microcomputed tomography, micro CT, and the famous CBCT. All right, uh, there was a study that was conducted in Brazil to study the association between the missed canals and the apical periodontitis. Um, this study showed that the frequency of having an apical periodontitis in teeth with at least having one missing canal or one untreated canal was significantly greater in comparison to the teeth with all canals treated. So the apical periodontitis was present 6.25 times greater in teeth with missing canal or untreated canal. So in the same study, uh, they showed that the mesobuccal root was the great had the greatest frequency of having a missing canal or untreated canal that because of the presence of the mb2 canal which was the most frequently missed canal in the study so in conclusion root filled teeth with at least one missed canal had a high prevalence of post-treatment apical periodontitis So, as what we learned from the previous slide, the failure to localize and treat all of the canals of the root canal system is one of the major causes of the root canal treatment failure. Now, a study by Azhar Iqbal uh, showed that the majority of endodontic failure were noted in maxillary molar followed by mandibular molar and maxillary premolar, while the mandibular canines showed the least endodontic failure. Uh, here again, a retreatment case of a maxillary first molar. The patient was referred to me with a lot of pain, and uh, 
with a lot of pain and swelling at that time and we can see how the primary dentist couldn't find or locate the MB2 canal and we can see in the final obturation x-ray the complex anatomy of the mesial root having both MB1 and MB2 canals. All right, now let's move on to give some facts about lower premolar. These teeth are very tricky. The mandibular first premolar uh, is uh, more prone to bifurcate uh, um, at the middle or apical third in 23 to 30% of the cases. And uh, in 20% of the cases, uh, they terminate in multiple apical foramina when we compare them to the second premolar and we when we talk about genetics we have to expect c-shaped canal pattern in the first premolar of chinese population while in the second premolar caucasian indian and middle eastern population show the higher prevalence of multiple root canal this case uh, of re retreatment for one of my friend he had this previous root canal treatment 10 years ago in uh, Syria and the patient had a lot of pain suddenly and then he was feeling tenderness below his jaw. When I took an x-ray, I saw this huge lesion around the uh, premolar and I was so lucky to finish the case as this. We can see how the tooth is uh, having a trifurcation uh, below the middle third and how it ends with three uh, root canal. I was lucky to take another x-ray after one year and a half and we can see the healing. So missing canal or untreated canal may cause failure of the root canal treatment. As soon as uh, we treated them, we can see the signs of healing after a year or year and a half. Here, another case of uh, lower first premolar this time with three portal of exit. This was done in uh, November 2020 and we have to know that these are somehow rare cases as it's shown here that type 1 canal configuration is the most prevalent in both first and second premolar. Here is a case. This is a preoperative. This is during obturation. I'm having my clamp on the adjacent tooth. And this is my final x ray. We can see how complex can the anatomy be for some teeth. All right, this is another case of a premolar. We can see the complexity in the apical part and we can also see how we have healing in very short time almost two months after the complete removal of the infected and necrotic pulpal tissue Here another case of lower first premolar. This case is very interesting to me. I really love this case as the first primary root canal treatment was done by me when I was a student. We can see how I obturated the tooth in the primary treatment to the full working length. Yet, when the patient used to come to my clinic for other um, treatments, scaling, polishings, or maybe some fillings, I used to take x-ray for this tooth and I always saw the lesion 
is getting bigger. The tooth was asymptomatic with no pain at all, but I knew that there was something wrong in the treatment. And because I used uh, rubber dam in the primary uh, treatment and I know that I irrigated very well, I really suspected another canal. So I talked to the patient, I told her, most probably, I know you don't have pain, most probably you have an extra canal here, this is why this lesion is getting bigger and bigger every time. Let me try to open the tooth and find a missing canal. I believe I have a missing canal here. So I she accepted this and uh, I gave her uh, anesthesia and then I started the retreatment of the tooth that I treated six or seven years ago. So I was focusing on finding the missing canal and it took me like three visits to find the missing canal and uh, we can see here in the second row how I located the canal here I was trying to do scouting and this is my master cone and this is the final obturation and we can see the healing that happened so quick just after locating the second canal so again missing canal or untreated canal can cause failure of the treatment no matter how good is the treatment all right and here we reach the last case or the last clinical case of today's lecture a very special case to me six canals lower first molar i really love this case the patient came to the clinic with a lot a lot a lot of pain i took an x-ray and I saw a huge radiolucency around the mesial root, but I didn't expect that complex anatomy. When I accessed the tooth, I was able to find six different canal orifices. And we can see how these canals, some of them join other canals and exit in the same portal of exit, while other canals uh, exit separately. So you can see from the final x-ray how complicated can be the root canal system. Six canals. This is very special. At the end, I have to tell you that in complex clinical situation, it's necessary to perform careful evaluation of the case before uh, starting the treatment and we have to establish an appropriate treatment plan otherwise there is a risk of underestimating the problem which may lead to the failure not only for the root canal therapy itself but also for the direct or indirect future restoration At the end, I would like to thank you for giving me your attention during this uh, lecture. I wish it's helpful. And these are my profiles on social media, my two Facebook accounts and my Instagram account. I would like to thank uh, Dentistry Online Group and uh, Dr. Mazen Dumani again for giving me this chance. Thank you so much. I wish you a happy Ramadan. Take care. Have a good night.